presentation today is by our secretary, Kevin Morrow, in his capacity as trustee of the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park and specialist in post-1945 computer history. Kevin's going to describe the rediscovery of the Harwell computer and the restoration process that led to it being re-awarded an entry in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's most durable computer. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I haven't, I haven't known what he is in the AV stuff for me, which is really quite strong. Um, it's usually a nice one. Is it too loud? It sounds loud. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Fine. Excuse me. Um, I can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me since I've got my own hearing fix, everyone that gives me a whispering now. So. <laughs> um, right, the Harwell Electron computer. This is um, about 18 months ago. I seem to be giving this lecture in different forms uh, endlessly to TV channels and so on. So I, 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 I hadn't occurred to me that we hadn't given this, this presentation to CCS in London until now. It's. Um, in fact, I need to do it in chronological order, and the machine spans 60, more than 60 years. The problem with doing that is that I can't show you a picture of the machine until around the year 2000, 2008, which means you have to spend 95% of, the, le of the, the lecture imagining what I'm talking about, which is tricky. So I'm going to spoil the surprise and show you a video of the machine working, which incidentally gives you some information about the machine as well. Um, and again, the technology has failed me somewhat, so I'm going to just minimise that. Excuse me, find the video. Let's get the right one. I should mention the video also includes me as well, which is going to be some duplication as well. Uh, it also includes. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. How can we do that? Yeah. Right, let me just try that uh, oh, there we go. Oh, no, can't see. Uh, also Delwyn as well, Delwyn's in the audience here with us. Excuse me. There isn't too much of doing this at all. This is the Wish computer, originally known as the Harwell computer, developed in the early days of atomic energy research in the UK. Now, I remember seeing the Wish computer on display in Birmingham in the late 1970s, uh, but sadly it wasn't, it wasn't working at that stage. And then for many years, the machine was lost. But in 2009, I'm looking through some photographs of the museum store, I found the original the picture of the original control panel. And eventually, after many visits, we found all the components of the machine. It's brought here to the National Museum of Computing, and we began the restoration process to return it back to a working condition. Now, I'm going to introduce Delwyn, who's part of the team that looks after the machine. Oh. What state was it in when we got when we got here? Well, it was very dirty, as you can imagine, having been in storage for so long. And also, one of the first things we had to do was work out where all the kit and parts we received actually went on yeah. the racks. And we did that from old photographs and other evidence that we had. So it's substantially complete now, as it, oh, yes. it was originally. Yes, that's right. Um, and all, pretty much all the parts you can see in the machine are still the original parts. Can you show the machine working? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing we need to do is look at how we actually get programs in, which what? happens over here on the tank So all the programs are loaded into the computer on paper tape, um, and someone actually has to punch this paper tape out by hand. Oh, wow. So we load it into the reader here, mm -hmm. and then to kick it off, we go back over to the control panel. Okay, so we'll now start the machine.
Hi, Bill. And what, what are we looking at here? Well, what you can see here is the uh, machine is uh, now loading its program into the memory stores. Right. Um, the interesting thing about this computer is it's entirely based on decimal counting, not binary like a normal computer. And you can actually, if these devices are called decatrons, and you can actually see directly from them what number they hold. These are all being cleared to zero. All right. So each one of those is a memory location? That's right. So all together the machine can store 90 numbers. The closest analogy is a man with a pocket calculator, which is goes quite slow. Very slow. Uh, however, unlike the man with a pocket calculator, this machine can carry on day and night, and it doesn't make mistakes. Absolutely. So, David, what state is the machine in now? Well, our restoration is now complete, uh, and we're able now to run programs once again that were written for the machine way back in the 1950s. Really? So, this this is now the oldest original working digital computer in the world? Yes, that's right. It gives us an understanding of the state of technology in the late 1940s. It's also doubly useful that it's such a visual machine that when we're teaching school children about computer, how computers work and about computer programming, they can see inside this machine and see it operating. It has somewhat spoiled the surprise of it all, <laughs> and it's told half of, half of the story as well. Um, but I think it makes sense that you can see the machine actually um, while I'm going to talk about it. Let's make the mouse back. Down the left hand side. Oh, for Pete's sake. There we go. Um, Go back over there. Down the left hand side, uh, I have a um, timeline and the little asterisk there will indicate where we are. So if anyone drifts off into the arms of Morpheus, when you wake back up again, you'll know how many years you've missed <laughs> as you go down. The machines had um, a quite remarkable life. Uh, Rachel talked about it being the, 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 the Guinness Book of Records of the world's most durable computer. It's an odd term, it's probably appropriate. I'm going to be talking about a period from the late 1940s, when the design of the machine began, through to its life at uh, and use at Harwell, its subsequent life from teaching at Wolverhampton College of Technology, its first display in uh, Birmingham Museum of Science and Industry, its period of being lost in storage, um, and then the resurrection of the machine, the restoration of the machine, and, and the reboot event. But to go back, right, to go back, very, very brief um, bit of information about how well, how hard well began. And many of you don't actually know this story, that most of the Certainly the initial knowledge of atomic energy and fusion that was developed in, actually a lot in Birmingham as well, uh, was shipped across to the US uh, for part of the Manhattan Project. On the agreement, that all of the information that was actually found there and um, research would be then shared with the UK afterwards. It didn't quite work, actually. Truman and Athley were in power at that point, and any agreement that we had with the US had been lost. Um, and all the information was actually cut off. There was no information back to the UK at all. Uh, in fact, even uh, the Mann Act in the US was actually established to protect that information, that it would be, quote, born secret and never shared. Uh, but a decision was made in the UK, primarily around um, <coughs> the bomb. Um, and Ernest Bevin fam famously said that after a pretty rough meeting with the Americans, that we must have this thing here, the bomb, with a bloody Union jet flying on the top of it. All of that was actually held in secret, and in fact, the, any any talk about um, a weapon wasn't mentioned until '48, because we didn't have any research facilities at all. So, um, the old Aria Harwell base was chosen to actually establish the Atomic Energy Research Establishment, and this is in '46. Uh, its first director was Sir John Cockcroft. 
uh, who basically went round all of the wartime establishments, Malvern, the Admiralty, and TRE and so on, and scooped up as many people. And it was a case of, look chaps, you don't want to go into academia, you don't want to go into industry, there's this new exciting prospect, come and work here. So a huge number of people working at Harlow. Um, really within two years of him starting, there was over 6,000 people working there. The amount that was spent on Harwell alone in those first 10 years, year on year, was more than the sum total spent on all the UK universities year on year as well. So this is serious investment. Uh, for many years, that chimney can be seen over Harwell. It's um, a ventilation chimney above the second UK reactor, Beppo, British Experimental Part Zero. That would just blast hot, cooling air up the top of the chimney. But for, it was visible for miles around, and it was actually said by local people in the village that, of course, they don't actually make anything up there. They've never seen smoke come out of that chimney. <laughs> <laughs> Five tons of hot air every minute, and enough to actually poke a hole in the clouds above it. Uh, and the Beppo was the prototype machine for the big production reactors at Wolverhampton. Uh, I thought about 6,000 people working there. A team of over 150 computers, people in the maths department, equipped with mathematical tables from WPA project in the US, and hand-cranked calculators, uh, things like facet calculators, bronze vegas, double bronze vegas, and so on. Um, Harlow would simply mop up maths graduates to do this. And, and, and frankly, desperately boring. The work they were actually going through, quite often simply producing tables, would just be just endless. Um, and with all the, all the usual problems about actually doing that. But a chance conversation with one of the theoretical, theoretical physics groups and the electronics division discussed about how they might automate some of these jobs. Um, at the same time, our three designers in the <coughs> Ted Cook Yarborough, Dick Barnes, and Gurney Thomas, had been visiting Cambridge to look at EDSAC and to take part in Wilkes's afternoon seminars. So they, were, they, were, they understood how a digital computer might actually be built. They were also working. Uh, obviously, the, the bulk of their time was building instrumentation and counting and measuring equipment as part of the nuclear industry. Uh, so they'd also come, recently come across decatron tubes, these single, these ten-digit counting tubes, which you can imagine the string of those together counting pulses from a nuclear detector. It's a perfect sort of counter. So they were interested in actually using that technology as well. Dick Barnes had been at Malvern. Uh, and working on the chain home calculator. So he was very knowledgeable about using relay-based systems to actually automate processes. So we have a whole thing, group of things coming together. Ted Cook Yarborough was just an absolute enthusiast and was just keen to do this. This is the sort of thing that we should be doing, chaps. And he had that, the Decatron tubes, Pitt Barnes' knowledge, Gurney Thomas' knowledge as well to actually do this. However, there's no budget for this at all. They needed to put the case to the two people, that, uh, the division head and the head of station, which is the John Crockcroft and Klaus Fuchs. Famously, they put together this presentation, turned up, and John Crockcroft and Klaus Fuchs would be enthusiastic, typically, and want to be involved, want to know all about it. This is a pretty lackluster affair. Didn't get much reaction from either of them at all. Eventually, Crockcroft said, well, Ted, if you think you can do it, just go away and do it. Get on with it. And that was it, the meeting was over. It was, I think, several years later that people had managed to put the timeline together. That it was literally a day or two before this meeting that John Cockroft had finally been told that Taz Fuchs had admitted to spying for the Russians at that point. Fuchs would uh, have either been expecting life imprisonment or the death sentence. So you can imagine that they weren't too impressed with these three chaps coming on with this podium <laughs> show about the computer. Um, but they were given the permission to actually go ahead. They started work on the design machine in 1949. Uh, construction was partly done by 
electronics division and why I'm at Harwell and partly outside. But they completed the first machine with what's called two store groups. I have a pointer. The two identical looking units on the left hand side, each is a set is a store group made of decatron tubes. They built that by 51 and are actually running tests. There are very few pictures of the machine. In fact, there's one picture of the machine from Harwell, which is this one. And this is the one that was published in um, Vivian Bowden's book, Faster, Faster Than Thought. And very little remains. And I was in touch with the archivist at Harwell, who's just got four billion slides in, the, in, a, in a room somewhere, and he's one chap part-time is working his way through them. But there seems to be very little left. Uh, they seem to have very few problems with commissioning the machine. It seemed to work exactly as they expected. Um, it was handed over to the oh, it was handed over to the programmers um, shortly afterwards. Now, I don't normally include this, but for this audience, I think you ought to, with the order code of the machine. Um, nothing too um, dramatic. It's designed primarily as sort of a, 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 let's say an automated calculator, producing these tables, working through repetitive calculations are important. So built in, multiply and divide, which is relatively unusual, but actually built in the hardware and the machine. Everything else, um, copying from store to store, uh, conditional jumps and so on. Lots of mentions of transferring programs from reader to reader, from tape reader to tape reader. The two ways of using the machine, you could actually read a program into store, and there's a limited amount of store, but if there's space, you could actually read it to store and run it from store. Typically, what would happen is you'd set up the program as a series of subroutines and data tapes on different tape readers. So a typical program would look a little like, I'm going to point to one second. Oh. A typical program, a machine would do a hardware bootstrap by looking for the first tape reader and a block marker, block one, the first tape reader. So the instruction we're reading in here, and this is to print a table of squares, it's just sort of 1 to 1.5, incrementing by 0.1. Here are the stores that we're ready, we're going to use, read in our data values from a different tape block, and then the last couple of instructions of this initialization stage search for block one on tape two, so that's a tape on another tape reader, find that block, and then transfer control to that block. Now this tape is actually in a loop. Literally, the two join ends join back together and glued back together. So this tape runs through, I'm not going to go through the code. The last thing it does is a conditional, so it's done an operation, this test the memory location, and then it'll do a conditional search then about whether to jump back <coughs> to find block one and tape two again. As the tape's in a loop, it'll carry on reading until the block marker comes around again. But conditionally, it would actually stop. That's how code was written at Wolverhampton. There's very little left from actual code from, um, from the Harwell days. That's, I don't think it's a sort of conspiracy. I think it was used for particular jobs once the job had finished, the code, that, that punch tape and the code and the paper was actually thrown away. But then, I mean, I have every reason to believe that's how it was programmed at Harwell. Here we've got, so we've got an initialization tape on one reader, a data tape on another reader, and this loop, this subroutine effectively of the paper tape. There are six paper tape readers in all, so it's quite common to have uh, subroutines, you know, if you wanted the square root, you'd jump off to tape reader 6 and run the square root. I'll come on to the tape readers in a minute. The tape readers are mechanical, with mechanical sensing. So if you've got a loop that's running around for all weekend with paper tape, by the time you finish, you've got five, five, six, five holes neatly punched in every single row of this tape. So it's quite common on a routine like that that you would punch the same routine 10, 20, 30, 40 times around the tape and have a huge tape that would actually not wear out quite as fast. 
as I say, it was handed over to the programmers in 52. They were, the bulk of the computers, the, the programmers there, the mathematicians, had never seen a machine like this at all, never seen a computer before. So there's some actual worry about this. This lady, Pamela Attree, who's still with us, uh, has actually been back to the museum and seen this. But they were all very doubtful and thought this possibly couldn't work, and if it did work, it wouldn't be accurate either. Thankfully, they were wrong. As I said, we have very little um, of original software from Harwell. Uh, these are the sort of tables it would be producing. I know very little about mathematics, but apparently it's a differential equation. That's the sort of table it would be producing. And effectively, it's to fill in. The tables they didn't have as published tables, they would write code to actually produce these tables. Um, and that's working very well. The downside, and I haven't mentioned this until yet, every line of that table would take at least five minutes to calculate. The machine would take, I think probably the worst case is up to about 10, 12 seconds for a division. I'm going to nod, I've got a nod at the front, that's okay. But obviously, this is a very slow machine. It was not built to be a fast machine. You could argue it was actually built to prove the technology, improve uh, Decatron tubes, but it was a very reliable machine. These guys knew how to make a machine that was reliable because their job was building a reliable kit to control huge nuclear reactors. And it was quite safe to leave the machine overnight, certainly, over the weekend. So if you actually required a set of tables like that, as long as you started the machine off the night before, you'd have the set of tables printed the next morning. So speed wasn't an issue for the sort of jobs it did. Ted Kugiala were published, there were lots of papers published, but in May 15, March 53, he published that at the time that was available to run the machine, omitting this five week years of damage, the machine was actually in use 55% of the time. More often than not, the periods where it wasn't in use is it had finished a job overnight and took so had any more work to do the next morning. That's 24 hours a day. That can't be done. 80 hours running for a week, 55% of the time. We think the five weeks of damage, you saw the memory um, stores, which are actually mounted on the frame itself. There's a story that Ted could be in charge of this was removing a memory store from behind the machine on step ladders, lifted off the rack, and then dropped the whole lot. And whether that was the, that the part of the cause of the five weeks, I'm not sure. The guys that worked with him, Dick and Gurney, knew exactly who had done it, but nobody ever mentioned it because it was the boss. <laughs> right. I mentioned this is Jack Howard's uh, memory of the machine. Um, little power can be left alone, uh, unattended for long periods. And again, everybody that used the machine at Harwell remembers this, the fact that it was set off with a job over Christmas. And it must have been a repetitive job printing tables. Um, by the time everyone was back in the new year, it was still going. Which is, which is some, uh, some feat. Of course, I think we can move on very quickly. Uh, by 1957, the guys in the electronic division had built their own uh, transistorized machine called the Cadet. Uh, Cadet was wholly transistorized. It's not usually described as such, but it was actually the, the first UK fully transistorized computer. Um, Cadet was built um, and ran for another 15 years. Harwell were also building, or buying commercial off-the-shelf machines as well, between for hydrogen and Mercury. And by that stage, had access to bigger machines over at AWRE in Aldermaston. So the, the Harwell machine was sort of redundant, but there was such a, uh, an affection for the machine that they certainly didn't want to simply dismantle it. Working at Harwell at the time, a chap called John Hammersley, 
who had uh, really allied to the Oxford Mathematical Institute, but had been um, on secondment to Harwell. And he organized a competition. He was very, very keen on uh, using technology in education, and also a strong maths teaching. He organized a competition for the college or university that could put together the best case for having the machine uh, after Harwell. 30 submissions were made from universities around the world, Scotland and Wales. A short list of nine was produced, and those nine people were actually asked to come to, to Harwell. The guys at Harwell will remember the nine groups arriving, quite often with the Lord Mayor, with all the regalia and everything else. It's quite serious stuff. Uh, John Hamilton, just to give you an idea. I go through all the work that John Hammersley produced. That's the title of one of his papers. I want to say, similar soft intellectual trash in schools and universities. <laughs> give you an idea of where, of where he's coming from, really. Um, the competition was a great success, and of course it was won by Wolverhampton College, Wolverhampton Staffordshire College of Technology. And they were very, very pleased with themselves. Very pleased. I, I suspect they had absolutely no idea what their rigs had won. Frankly. There was a comment here, for instance, it can, for instance, work out wage calculations much quicker than human beings. It certainly can't, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, but it's important in researching the history of the machine is that they took every opportunity they had to publicise the fact that they'd got this, they had got this machine. This was in more hands and express and star with all of these clippings. If it wasn't for Wolverhampton promoting the machine, we would have lost all of that information. <coughs> Wolverhampton took the opportunity to rename the machine. Previously, it's simply been the Harwell computer or the Harwell Decatron computer. It's now the Wolverhampton instrument for teaching computing from Harwell. Um, yes, we well, you know how these things actually get sort of thought out and so on. Um, again, lots of um, press coverage, this is Birmingham Post, of the machine in place. Uh, it didn't take them long to get the machine um, commissioned. Harwell couldn't devote any time to them at all, so it was literally collected in a furniture van from Harwell, taken to Wolverhampton, and then, here you go guys, make the best of it. This is a famous picture. Of, of the machine. Uh, it's the picture that we have on the front cover of the book as well. Uh, the machine in place at Wolverhampton. And they had always promised to support local industry. The local industry had actually paid for some of the work in the lab and to actually collect the machine from Harwell. They'd always promised that. And one of the uh, problems that Chubb had, Chubb, the people that make locks and keys, based in Wolverhampton was working out the patterns, I don't quite understand this, the patterns of fingers in mortise locks, or, or no, not, I think mortise locks, keys in mortise locks. There are only certain combinations that are valid, because otherwise they end up too, too thin and too brittle. So this problem was given to a sixth form student, which is that chap there, Peter Burden. Uh, he'd been at Wolverhampton Ground School and had used the machine in his holidays, He'd been on the course, uh, a single day course of Wolverhampton, but was using the machine in his holidays. And this problem was given to, to Peter. Peter will come back in the story shortly. It's only about the length of tape. That's described as just one routine of about 10 instructions, but printed something like 30 times around the tape. Um, mylar tape, which would have been solution, is simply just too expensive for the, for the students. The chap on the left, because you know how these photographs are arranged. There's a chap called Frank Hawley. There's absolutely nothing to do with the machine. He's probably never seen it before in his life. <laughs> <laughs> but it happens to be one of the, one of the lecturers at, at the college. Um, it happened to be in the wrong place at the time. This picture was important because it was also they promoted the machine in... Um, it was a Commonwealth Technology Week as well. Um, and different universities around the country and colleges were putting on events. The, the important man. But poor Frank Hall is now immortalised and reading this tape has absolutely no idea of what he's looking at at all. Again, more public more, more press information. The chap that 
champion the machine at Bullhampton, with Cecil Ramsbottom. And Cecil Ramsbottom never lost him the opportunity to get the press in as well. And they organised, oh, it's not really real, they organised a 10th, 10 year anniversary of the machine. And tall chap at the back is one of the designers, Ted Cook Yarbra, and that's Dick Barnes in front of him. And they were inviting back to Wolverhampton for a lunch to celebrate the machine. And by that stage, it was in absolutely daily use by um, an undergraduate course in computing and also teacher training and students from the local Wolverhampton grammar school. Now again, the machine faces the chop that it might be dismantled. But this time, I think there's more press coverage as well, uh, Cecil Ramsbottom absolutely determined that the machine wouldn't actually be dismantled and arranged for it to go to Birmingham Museum of Science and Industry. We'll come back in a moment. He also did this. He had it listed in the Guinness Book of Records, 1973, as the world's most durable computer. And we have the letter back from one of the McQuarters. Uh, it was known as Guinness Superlatives in those days as well. Um, so we have that, that, that record. Um, again, they, um, 22 years they've had the machine, um, they bought commercial machines, they bought an ICL machine, uh, an IBM machine as well, but had a special day to actually commemorate that. Sadly, that, that was filmed by what was the local Birmingham ITV franchise, ATV, and again that's lost, or possibly in Birmingham somewhere, um, that would be terrific to actually have that. Peter Byrne, who was a sixth form student at that point, uh, had gone off to Cambridge to read maths, gone off to teach in a grammar school to teach maths after that, but actually felt he'd be better off teaching in a university, and then came back to Wolverhampton and took over the teaching using the machine at Wolverhampton. And he was there on the day uh, of the retirement. And remembers being asked by the press um, on camera, this is ATV. Will the witch enjoy her retirement? He said, it's the first time I come across idiots from the press like that, actually. So it was quite a struggle to come up with an answer. Um, but then, no, it goes on to Birmingham Museum of Science and Industry. Birmingham Museum of Science and Industry is fantastic. There is no other description for it. it, it it's huge. It's an old electroplating factory. That's just the front of the museum. There's a canal. Well, there's the engine house there. There's a canal down there which runs back, and the museum runs down to that. It's an absolute, it was an absolute rabbit warren, with galleries and rooms tucked away everywhere. It was just completely fantastic. Everything sort of, a geeky sort of 14, 15 year old could possibly ever want, and I spent most Saturday afternoons there. <laughs> uh, they had it on display from 73, so I think 94, but I think that might be a bit late. They certainly attempted to run the machine, because we have a copy of a letter back from Harwell to Birmingham explaining about some of the problems that they might be having and how to fix them. But I, I, I think it was a half-hearted attempt and it certainly wasn't displayed regularly. Um, that's when I first saw the machine. I think I must have been, if I was 15, say, it would have been 70, 76, 75, 76 or something. I remember seeing the machine there. And I drew the machine, and I had a pencil drawing of the machine, which in fact, as mothers do, my mother had actually kept as well. So we'd actually still got that. There's a picture I can't find either at the moment as well, of me at 14, uh, with a little anorak on standing next to a steam engine looking as miserable as sin, but I can't find the picture I could always have shown you. Uh, it was a fantastic place, without doubt. So the machine stayed on display until 94. 94, Birmingham closed Museum of Science and Industry to build something called the Think Tank, which is a science exploratory and something other. The industry was dropped completely, which is tragic for Birmingham. Um, and the machine was put into storage. It went into a, a not ideal storage centre in Birmingham City Centre Charlotte Street, and along with other machines, and in 2002, Chris Burton, many of you know, in the audience, was at Birmingham taking pictures of the HEC-1 computer, primarily. Um, and I think he just 
in a break, took some other pictures of other bits of computer kit around the museum, including that control panel. These are just the frames, all of the relay units and the electronics are removed, but that control panel is there. Now, I must have seen this picture in 2002, but didn't think any more of it. Uh, <coughs> and again, you know, in what must have been 2008, saw that picture again, remembered what it was, and indeed there's a picture of that in Simon Lampton's book on early British computers, of the machine, recognised what it was, and thought there was an opportunity to actually go back to Birmingham and find out how much more of the machine they actually kept. Well, by this stage, they moved to a fantastic collection centre, again just off Birmingham city centre. Uh, air conditioned, bone dry, um, multiple levels of storage, very well organised. That's just some of the cars. Don't really know Birmingham at all. You can just about read source. Yeah? That, the Birmingham HP source site. <laughs> so when they knocked down Birmingham HP, uh, HP source, that's where the actual sign went. It's sitting on the floor then and slowly falling to bits, I'm afraid. Um, the collection centre is fantastic. The other side of the uh, warehouse from those cars is a collection of some of their computer kits. Now, uh, this is fantastic for people who are interested in this, about uh, picking out what's what. Well, there's an Orion, this is not mine, isn't it? An Orion desk at the front. There's a tape, uh, tape drive, um, big disk drive back, which we did establish at one point as it was. That looks like a KDF 9 disk drive to me. We can have, oh, we've, we've been through all the things. I can send you the emails as well. I think <coughs> I didn't find it. Um, there's a BTM machine there. It's a Fluxerite of Thades with a counter to <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just at the back, can you see those three units there? That's the top of one of the Highwell machine racks. And you can't actually get around any of that as well. So we spent most of the time actually moving bits around and actually sort of holding a camera at arm's length and taking a picture and then thought we'll look at the results afterwards. But in fact the machine was broken up, bits of it were lying on across the floor, all the units, whatever units had been put back on the rack were all of a sudden in the wrong place. But at that point we looked and thought, a sense that there is enough here. Yeah, there won't be 90, there won't be 100% of it to all, 90%, but there's enough that we could actually restore the machine. In the event, and this is several visits later, we found it's got to be 90, 95% of the machine? More, perhaps. Like more, more than 95% of the machine. In fact, I think we're only short of one item now, aren't we? Um, at that point, the question about have we found enough to actually restore this machine? Have we found all the part or sufficient parts of the hardware? We, we didn't expect to find everything, but you know, there are certain bits we could fabricate certain bits. Do we have any manuals or diagrams? Well, apparently not. <coughs> about them. Are the original designers and users or programmers able to help? And again, at that point, we didn't have no anyone any was around at all. Do we have everything we need to restore the machine? Do we have the people, the skills, the time, the finance, the space to do this? And what would we eventually do with the machine? I think these are all the same questions we ask about starting a restoration of any machine. Now, as luck would have it, there's an awful lot of luck in this story. When we started looking through some of the bits that Birmingham had got, we found this box. Now, this is a, um, it's a, um, a pallet, a wooden pallet, with some edges and frame on the side of it, full of spares, with spare valves, you can't see those, those, those paper tapes and programs in there. Uh, so this is what have you. When we started digging through this, we found manuals, explanations of how the machine worked, everything that had been uh, given to Wolverhampton from um, Harwell. There's even, if anyone's involved in atomic, uh, nuclear physics, these little angular lead bricks that you have to surround experiments in nuclear physics. There are a few of those in there as well. Uh, nobody's going to look at the Geiger counter yet. <laughs> Possibility. So we really, and that was, that was really quite a success. Something else happened as well. At a BCS 
briefly. I think it was Dan actually was talking to somebody uh, and mentioned about doing this. Somebody at the meeting said, well, actually I know someone who used to work at Harwell and that's Ted Cookie Harbour and he's still living in uh, Abingdon. So we went over to see Ted, uh, Tony Fraser from the museum as well. We went over, we'd also got in touch with Dick Barnes at that point. And we, I think Tony showed them their, the scans of the, diet, of the drawings that we found. Um, and Dick as well, over here, had kept a, line, um, a scrapbook over the years of all the cuttings of the machines that when he, you know, he'd seen it in um, Wolverhampton Express and Star. They were both absolutely thrilled that the um, machine was working. Ted really quite frail at that point. Uh, probably not as frail as we thought, because when we started actually this restoration process, and Del was the expert of this, We'd send odd diagrams and scope traces and so on to Ted. who would come back and say, yes, you find that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that needs fixing, and so on. It's pretty sharp. But having, having the power of them really, at that point, I think we were then committed to actually restore the machine. We put together a proposal for CCS in May, uh, and then the proposal went into um, Birmingham Museum's Collection Centre. Now the Collection Centre acts as a, sort of, uh, as a sort of store for Birmingham Art Museum, Science Museum, Natural History Museum, whatever it is. Um, we did another visit as well. Oh no, it was great fairly quickly. It seems like ages, but actually fairly quickly we had a note back from Birmingham that was agreed. This came from the City Council that they would agree to have this. A couple more visits to the museum and the CCS kindly awarded us the funds to actually transport the machine um, to National Museum Computing. And it arrived in 2009, September. Carry gently. Carry gently uh, do exactly what they say they do uh, for a computer kit. They're used to moving around mainframes and fantastic Cisco, I don't know what everyone what really buys these days. They've been very good to us because we always actually present them with something which is slightly off the wall to actually uh, <laughs> to, to move as well. And they've been very good. We've used them for, I think the witch wasn't the first time actually. We've used them for the move in the 1301 recently as well. Again, the control panel coming off the back of the van. So again, it's quite a special moment that was actually, that, you know, this was for real at that point. Notice it's actually again this witch name from Birmingham, uh, from, from Wolverhampton. And some of these odd little um, labels as well, which obviously people were put on in uh, the museum. Quite a lot of interest. We reassembled it um, physically, I think, physically reassembled it in the, in the place where it was going in the museum. There's quite a lot of interest from straight away. Um, again, each of these sections there, they had covers on that point are the store groups and the power supply sitting at that end. I mentioned finding circuit diagrams. I don't think we ever thought in a million years we'd find anything such as this. This is a, a bound book of beautifully drawn circuits of all of the machine. I mean, really quite fantastic. Um, they were produced by Harwell. What size? What size are they? Uh, <laughs> what's small? It's only to lay four size. Oh. And as I said, these were produced by Harwell. <coughs> Wolverhampton had attempted, well, no, that's not fair, had actually made some modifications themselves which weren't documented, which is, continues to be a bit of a problem. But as well as the circuit diagram, there's also a theory of operation which Dick Barnes had produced at the time. And this described in detail exactly how the machine works with reference to those circuit diagrams. And uh, this just, just, just seemed valuable, really. Uh, it's a fantastic thing to have. I mentioned the paper tape readers, and we tend to show these paper tape readers um, because we've been unable to trace where they came from. Uh, it seems very unlikely they were built well, I mean, it's almost certain they weren't built specially at um, Harwell. 
some of them have serial numbers, and there are gaps in the serial numbers. Some of the serial numbers as high as 28, which indicates that obviously a lot were made. We've never seen them anywhere else. Um, I, it's quite a mystery. I have a vague memory of reading something about them while researching this machine that was in French. And I put two and two together in my mind and thought, well, Paul was working a lot with Chalk, Chalk River in um, Canada at the time, sharing technology, and whether that's the link or not, we don't know. But we, we always show these pictures just in case somebody you know, pipes up and says, because uh, typically, obviously, on any machine of this period, you see Korean equipment. That's what you normally expect. That's a very small example of a paper tape of a subroutine. Sub um, I think that's probably a bit artificial, but it's probably only half a dozen instructions on there on at the most. This is what we did get, though, from primarily from Wolverhampton. Um, the tape itself punched. A little card cut out of a shoebox, we reckon, for most of the examples, <coughs> indicating things like the start address, where it would be loaded, and what the function, what the actual purpose of the program was. Lots of the programs then are printed um, as a sort of program listing, it's, it's obviously it's all machine code, as a program listing, uh, on these tapes. Um, now that's quite a thick one, I've seen quite a small ones, but quite narrow tape like slip tape on um, uh, sort of wartime machines. We've not been able to find the machine that produces those tapes. Now, whether it's still in Birmingham, whether it's been lost, it'd be really quite nice to actually find that. Um, but obviously, I think this was important, certainly in education, that once the tape had actually been um, punched, that the students had a sort of legible copy of the, the program itself. Quite a lot of these, 90% of them are to do with clearing the store before you start anything else. <laughs> um, however, Wolverhampton put together a, um, a textbook on, in fact, numerical analysis, with a whole chapter at the end on the witch computer. And again, there are example programs, and that is all which is useful. A close up, uh, the tape. What's that? Square root, square root demonstration. It's like x in 30, root x in 31, prints on, whatever. That's typically the sort of thing that we've, we've, we've found. All of those, of course, we've actually have a, an optical paper tape reader and we've read all of those in and have hard, you know, safe copies of all of these tapes. And it's not, I think it's one of the videos, typically if a tape's been through the reader a few times, you can see the impressions from the sensing pins on the tape. That one looks very good, as it hasn't been used much. The tapes, the tape readers at Harwell were arranged on a desk very similar to this, around the six readers around the tape, uh, with loops of tape. And you'll see that example on the video. They also included a tape reperforator. Wolverhampton talk about writing programs which needed intermediate results. That you put the intermediate results off onto on the <coughs> perforator with enough blank tape between the two, two that you could put the perforator output back into one of the readers and pick up those intermediate results later on. This is pretty sophisticated stuff, isn't it? I don't think it's like this. <laughs> uh, page printer, free page printer. Bulk of this equipment predates the machine and he's pretty well known as well. Um, and we're lucky at the museum that we have people that this is their sort of bread and butter about getting the English and working again. One person that did an absolutely sterling job is Eddie Washington. It's not a very good picture, it's like a, a mine actually. Uh, um, Eddie uh, worked at the post office for a long time, for a month again, I think he took the question and understands exactly how to repair and straighten up Post Office 3000 star reloads. Um, there are, I will tell you how many content, uh, contents there are on it, probably find it, but I could get a bit quicker. There are just over 7,000 relay contacts in the machine. Uh, Eddie went through the whole lot, straightening them all out. Some of the repairs, 
that Wolverhampton had been um, a tad crude. So, you know, people had obviously been in the pliers to try and adjust the timing by bending contacts backwards and forwards as well. Um, but Eddie's repaired all of those. Um, to do such a sort of a sterling job on that and go through them all at the start has been very helpful because generally we know now that the relays are okay and the contacts are okay. That's a sort of indication of some of the damage, you know, the machine has actually been in storage um, for that length of time, it's all pitted contact. I mentioned the power supply. Um, I need to get fairly vague on some of the restoration, some of the uh, electronics here, and hopefully people will have questions at the end, because there was a plug in over all of that. So, power supply was tricky. Um, Rubber-covered wires, for a start, which had all actually perished. A couple of examples of that, um, which needed to be taken off the machine, annotated where they'd come from, saved, and preserved, and then replaced. Uh, now, let me get this right. This is part of the power supply. Uh, some of these are sealed, potted uh, inductors. I think probably from the period when it was at Wolverhampton, things had been run not well, and they'd overheated. And in some of them, the pitch had actually just leaked out completely from these potty components, and they had to be reassembled and put back together. I've got a pretty gruesome picture. Oops. That's some of the mess left behind. Um, again, you know, um, typical rectifiers from the period. There. That's... The inside of one of those potted inductors, uh, with most of the pitch actually gone, and that had to be sort of cleaned up, restored, to get leaks in the can repaired, and it put back together again. And there we are, shiny uh, inductor back in its case. All of the components as well, all of the actual passive components, were tested individually as well. Uh, to see what had drifted and what was still in range. And again, power supply was probably one of the trickiest bits. So this um, desktop power supply was lashed up just to, to provide a regulated HT supply, primarily to start checking some of the decatrons. Very early on, we had our first decatrons lit up. Um, obviously, when you power up a decatron tube, they light at random. So this was the first time we'd actually seen those power up, which is, again, something fairly special. I'll leave Dylan perhaps to talk about the decatrons, but they, there's a worry, of course, at the start, whether any of these things, any of the decatrons would work at all. But in fact, very, very few have failed. They've been incredibly probably possible most reliable parts of the machine. Um, uh, an awful lot of cleaning in the video, and uh, Delwyn mentioned how filthy the actual machine was, and all the interconnects were actually covered in dust and bits of rust and so on. So a lot of it is just very, very careful cleaning. Um, and that's one of the sort of interconnects on the rack that the physics would actually clip onto. Some damage as well, some physical damage, that lock should have been a straight line back there and broken. A lot of the wires in this section were pretty taut, so if anything's actually been knocked, all the wires would have snapped away from that as well. So again, all of that had to be gone through and repaired. There's a whole series of really umbilical cables along the floor connecting the different racks together as well. Lots of broken conductors in those. But by room 2012 over here, Phil Ramsbottom, uh, Cecil Ramsbottom, I mentioned, policy guy at Wolverhampton, and I think passed away. That's Phil Ramsbottom, Cecil's uh, son, who bought with him, presented back to us, the key to the machine, an inscription, that had been actually prepared when the uh, Guinness Book of Records was announced. <laughs> they came to that, there were some incredibly special moments to, to have that, and that's actually now on the wall at the museum. Now, I've, I've rattled through this because I'll, partly I'd like to show you the video of the reboot event. 
We are by 20, well, September, November 2012, the machine was basically working. Uh, the machine doesn't suddenly work, you all know that. Fairly early on, we had some new <coughs> relay-based systems. So we were working programs to, to read, read a block off one paper tape, transfer to another paper tape, and transfer it back again to prove that, to demonstrate the machine. But by uh, December, no, by September, October of 2012, all the arithmetic unit was working, the control unit was working. And we wanted to arrange an event to actually the so-called reboot event to show the machine working. Uh, and I'd like to show this video. It's about 15 minutes long, I'm afraid, but it is actually, I don't think what worth seeing. I think in the meantime. Right, I'm trying to find the video. Ah, uh, oh, 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 oh. things are not nice. Anyone sees a nice point, do not you? Yeah, there is. No, there isn't. Right. So I've got my glasses and I can see that screen and I can't see this screen. So it's uh the bottom here. Now um, Delwyn show, but we have a new audience. Uh, Ted Cook Yarbrough, who's going to be on the right hand side, and Dick Barnes next to him. Uh, one of the operators, in, uh, no more than operators, a guy called Bart Fossey. Bart Fossey led the mathematicians at Harwell during this period as well, and he came back for the event. And Peter Burden, who we last saw as a 16 year old sitting next to the machine, also came back to the event. Um, it's a bit cheesy in places because these things like this always are. I don't make any excuses for this already, aren't I? I'm sorry. machine that's had, that's avoided the chop on three occasions. It's had three retirements and has managed to keep going. Now whether that's the spirit of the machine that's managed to do that, I don't know. So we're now actually celebrating its fourth life. Uh, now the Harwell Decatron computer was designed and built by well, two chaps on my left and Gurney Thomas, who I'm afraid isn't with us anymore, in early 1950 at the Atomic Energy Research Centre in Harwell, near Oxford. Now, we were very happy, as I said, to have two of the original designers, to have Ted Cook Yarbrough and Dick Barnes with us today. Ted Cook Yarbrough, who was responsible for, really, I think, the instigation and the, the design of the machine. Um, it's a very simple question. What, why did you build the computer? What was the situation in Harwell? This wasn't an experiment, was it? This was a project to get a working machine rather than research. That's right. Did Harwell, did Harwell, the management at Harwell encourage you in this sort of enterprising work? Well, we hardly need a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> 
obviously this is probably the biggest store of Decatron tubes that actually exists in the world before. Why, why Decatron tubes? Why relay-based technology? Because all the very early computer projects, uh, despite the obvious problems of, 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 of building them, they all had the problem of how do we store data and the instructions. Uh, and some of the, uh, as at Manchester and at Cambridge, for example, the, uh, the development of storage devices uh, was a, a, a major project in its own right. Whereas, thanks to Ted having spotted the Decathlon, here was something which was already made storage device for one decimal digit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did the designers know what, how computing would turn out? How do you see this machine now? Uh, I, 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 I think it is impossible that, pe that, 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 that people could imagine the future because the, the real breakthrough came through came several years later with first the transistor and then the integrated circuit so that um, all these um, all these digital cameras which have been flashed around here today have got processors in them which are much much more powerful than this. Before the machine arrived, what what tools were available for the mathematicians at Harwell? Basically, I joined Harwell at the end of 1948, and I joined the computing group, which was a part of the theoretical physics division in Harwell. And the group was run by Dr. Jack Howlett. And we provided a service of computational expertise, if you like, to the various divisions in Harwell. So when the machine was delivered to us in the 50s, it was regarded by us as an additional tool we'd been previously using. Um, sometimes electrical calculating machines, sometimes hand calculating machines on doing the calculations that solved the problems the scientists wanted. And really by 1957, um, the machine wasn't really being used at Harwell anymore. Um, more modern commercial systems were being bought. Uh, now this is the first time when the machine might have been dismantled or scrapped. Uh, but a mathematician called John Hammersley, who um, was had a, a given lectures at, at Harwell, uh, he actually belonged to the Oxford Mathematical Institute, organised a, a competition, a competition to find a college or, or potentially a school or university that could put forward the best case for having this machine. And the college that won that was then called the Wolverhampton College of Technology. And they won the competition. And the machine was shipped to them from Harwell, back of a big furniture lorry in 1957. And they assembled the machine within a week. So they were really still quite switched on, the machine working. It then took them until December to work out actually finally how to program the machine. <laughs> And at that point, we named the machine. Um, they renamed the machine the Witch, which is the Wolverhampton, and I know it's right, it's the Wolverhampton Instrument for Teaching Computation from Harwell. But from 57 onwards, it was known as the Witch. Now, um, we're very lucky that the machine at Wolverhampton was championed by one of the staff members there, Cecil Ramswatton. And Cecil wrote papers, notes, manuals, really got the press involved and got lots and lots of pictures. Any opportunity he could got the press involved to take pictures of the machine. And that's now an invaluable resource. Actually, if that hadn't happened, we'd have, that whole period would have been lost. One of the photographs that always appears whenever this machine is talked about from Wolverhampton mm -hmm. is one of the masters and one of the students standing in front of the machine examining a piece of tape in the most incredible detail. Uh, and, uh, the master was a chap called Frank Hawley, who looks like he's seen a vision in this paper tape. And, and the chap next to him was a young grammar school chap uh, from Wolverhampton Grammar School. But this chap was uh, Peter Burton, and Peter's with us today. The college was organising something called Commonwealth Technical Training Week, and we wanted to get some publicity for that. Now, at this stage, I'd already done a computer program for a local, co local company designing keys and uh, for Messrs Chubbs. So it's a nice application of the week. Chugged away over two or three weekends doing that. Um, 
So this was an obvious thing to hang the publicity on, and the Mountain Express and Star came around and said, we'll have a photograph of you doing that. And I got involved with the machines, so I, uh, there was an evening class for, an evening lecture for local six science six forms, and I was about it, I was hyped after that one Thursday evening in November 60, I think it was, and uh, uh, after about an hour, they said, well, that's how the machines work, come and have a go, chaps. I mean, never having even thought about computer programming before, Within an hour and a half, I was actually doing it. We programmed it to work out e to the x, the first three terms of the series. I remember doing that. But as, as Peter said, by 1973, the college had moved on to more commercial systems as well. Uh, and the machine finds itself redundant again. And, and again, it could have been scrapped. But actually, part of the work, because of Cecil Ramsbottom, he arranged two things. He got in touch with the Guinness Book of Records at the time and had the machine listed as the world's most durable computer the longest living computer. And that's a record which we believe still, ha uh, still holds. Cecil also uh, arranged that the machine wouldn't be lost and would go to Birmingham Science Museum, Birmingham Museum of Science and Industry. Now, this is where I get involved, um, because I, uh, in late 1970, well, 77, 78, I was a sort of geeky teenager, not that the word geek had ever been invented or thought about but spent every Saturday afternoon at Birmingham Science Museum, and I knew absolutely everything that was on display. Um, and a whole group of us knew more about the artifacts on display than any of the curators knew. And, and I spent hours staring at this machine, but then jumping ahead really 30 years. Uh, and at that point, I'm a uh, trustee of this museum, of getting this museum going, and also a member of the Computer Conservation Society. And that's a, a, an organisation in the UK that's been responsible for rescuing and saving machines and building replica machines. And I was looking through a series of pictures that were taken at a storage centre in Birmingham uh, by a colleague of mine, uh, Chris Burton, who's with us today, and saw in the corner of the picture uh, the control panel from the computer. Everything else had been dismantled, had been quite thoroughly, completely dismantled, but I saw the control panel. I thought, oh, actually, I know that. I know exactly what that is. And that triggered, really, my going back to finding notes, actually going back to see my mom to get the notes that I kept, which she came, which, which kept, of course, mm -hmm. and all of these notes. Uh, and the a whole series of visits between uh, myself and the rest of the team, and Tony Fraser and Johan at that stage, we went back to Birmingham and scoured the whole place. We found... I think at that point, probably about 90% of the machine uh, throughout that collection <coughs> centre. And that machine, that was then brought back to the museum here, 2009, and started the process of restoration. Derby, I've talked about the machine getting here. What state was the machine in? Well, as you can imagine, um, after 30 plus years in storage, everything was very dirty. Um, apart from that, the main problems we had were a little bit of damage that had occurred within uh, storage at some point, so wires snapped and a few components dented and broken. But very early on we realised that we got all the important pieces uh, and that actually rest restoring the machine was going to be feasible. Right. What I need you to do now to explain to me and to everybody else is actually how the machine, in simple terms, how the machine works. Okay. This is the this is actually the perforator which you mentioned earlier, Kevin, that we, we found on a subsequent visit to um, the, the, the collection centre. For those not familiar with it, which I imagine most of you are not, it's called a perforator. And what it does is it allows you to type out program code and that's punched onto punch tape. So this is what a punch tape looks like, the sort that the machine uses. It has five holes and the pattern of holes that's punched out on, on each column there represents an instruction that the machine is going to, to operate on. And once you've punched out your program, you will then load it into um, the selection of paper tape readers that you can see here. So this is one of them here. So moving on from the tape readers, come over here. Um, we mentioned relays earlier. Um, you can see we've removed it, two of the covers, so you can see um, the relays. Obviously all of these covers contain relays under them. Uh, these relays are the same type that we used in telephone exchanges uh, in the 1940s, 50s. And of course, very reliable, very well built. Uh, and, and unfortunately, they're also mainly the reason that the machine does operate quite slowly, because being mechanical, it takes time for the contacts to move. Um, arithmetic in the machine is carried out using a device called a Decatron, which we touched on earlier. 
So these are decatrons here. In fact, I'll, I'll point at the brighter ones. They're actually all on. I don't know if you can see that. There's two different types of decatron here. And if you look at um, a row of stores across here, you can see uh, exactly the number that the machine is, is, is storing. Um, but it, it really does mean that um, it's very easy to actually just look at the machine and see what it's doing. It's really like looking inside the machine in terms of the operation. Once you've run your program and you want to get results out, that's done over here. And we've got two output devices. Under this cover, you've got what we call a reperforator, and that punches the results out onto paper tape, exactly as the paper tape that is fed into the machine. So you would do that if you wanted to, you know, if you were printing out intermediate results that you want to then feed back into the computer. The other thing we have is a printer. Might not look much like a printer for anyone unfamiliar with uh, 1940s technology. These are both, these peripherals, I should say, they're both much older than the rest of the machine. They're actually 1940s technology. And I, we think that they were to hand at the time, and they were specially modified at Harwell to, to work with the machine. And the time has actually come, Darwin. Can you actually run a program for us? I hope so. Right. I'm certainly going to try. working fine all day, I'm sure it will be great. Yeah. yeah. So, first of all, we'll enter an instruction to start the program off. So now it starts to read from the paper tape reader. Now, it's now stopped and is prompting me for input. I'm going to give it um, a first number to be multiplied. And if you keep an eye on the stores, that's going to go into this top store here which has been cleared to zero, so that's that one. I'm going to put in 3, 3, 3, and so on. And you can see that's going to roughly a 3 o'clock position. That's been printed out. This, by the way, illustrates the speed at which the machine operates each digit. So now the second number, I'm going to put in uh, 3.0. Okay, now what's going to happen in a moment? We've got our two numbers to multiply. The result, as I said, will go into the accumulator here. So first of all, that will be cleared, and then the machine will do its multiplication operation. And you'll actually be able to see it forming the answer one digit at a time as it goes. So we'll let it run. And there you can see a row of nines appearing in the accumulator. Now that's being printed out on the, on the printer. When the program completes, the green light comes on to tell you that everything is, is good and finished and it's ready for its next job. I have my hand. <laughs> right, 3.3333 multiplied by 3 is 9.9999. Yeah. Really cool. <laughs> Bart Fossey mentioned earlier uh, about a chap called Jack Howland, uh, who uh, was responsible for computing at, at, at Harvard. Uh, now, Jack, in 1979, um, described or remembered uh, a test or possibly a race between, <laughs> between Bart Fossey and the machine. Now, I think that I think this this story has grown over the years, and I think it was some exaggeration at the start. Actually, the story is that Bart sat down with this machine and actually attempted a race. And the story goes on as well that they both kept up with each other for half an hour, and then Bart, as you retired, exhausted, when the machine <laughs> carried on. Now, I suspect this might have been a, a, a part of a test or a bit of fun. But in that vein, what we're going to have to do shortly is rerun that test. Now, Bart has actually agreed to do that as well. So Bart will be equipped with a mechanical calculator, and uh, Delwin has devised a similar program for the machine. And we think one way or the other, actually, I think they should be able to keep up with each other. The story you've heard is not actually correct, but nope. never mind, it's a good story. <laughs> what I actually did was to code a machine to solve a set of ordinary differential equations. So what I did was brought the tapes into the machine room, set them up, set the machine going, 
and I took the hand calculator that I had into the machine room at the same time and I started doing the calculation by hand because I knew what the algorithm was. And I did three steps. At that point, I needed to see whether what I got myself agreed with what was on the printer when the, when the printer was available. So, I stopped. But I reported the fact that when I got, was writing down the last of the elements on the paper, right from the first step, the machine was producing its results. Same on the second line, and same on the third line. As Dick Barnes will have told you, the machine was known to be not very fast. And we knew when we had it that it wasn't going to be a fast machine. So it wasn't altogether surprising that I got that result. And I reported it to Dr. Howlett that I, what had happened. And I said, that confirms that the machine is a little faster than a hand desk operator. And he embellished it in your <laughs> Right. So are we ready? I'm not going to wave a flag. <laughs> Okay, we'll start. Let's we? go. Okay. So I start by setting 1.1 on the on multiply. And I notice it's 1.21, so I copy that onto, onto the keyboard, deduct it to make sure it's right, and then multi multiply it by 1.1. And I see the result is 1.331. Right. Well, you have a moment. that down. <laughs> I'm not very efficient at this now. I was. <laughs> so this is, and this is the number 2.197. I'm going to do one more. 1.4. 1.4 multiplied by 1.4. But where a problem had something which you did over and over and over again. It was ideal for this machine. Bart, thank you. I think that's extremely game. I think Bart and the machine could probably do with a round of applause. <laughs> and I, I think we can keep going this time. But I'm extremely relieved. Absolutely, yeah. Elsa. Thank you, Bart. What does a witch mean to us and to you? It's always important to know how this whole machines work and to get them working to prove we can do it. But it's more important than that, it's education. You saw like some of you that we had as a part of school children here before you came in. And they were learning an awful lot, which they would not learn otherwise. And that applies to all the things that we do at TNC with very old computers and very new computers. And Kevin and Darwin have written a book it's in draft still because we want to put in the book photographs of today's proceedings. But then it will be available and on sale. So thank you again for coming. I think it's been a remarkable and a marvellous afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope it wasn't too indulgent showing you that, but it was it was such a special day. Um, Ted was really quite frail by that stage because he was wheelchair bound. He hadn't left um, his home for, for, for many years beforehand. His family said that he would have crawled across hot coals here and there. That was in December, uh, and sadly, no, that was in November, and sadly uh, Ted passed away in just the January just after that. But it was so, it's a privilege to have the machine working to show Ted who did that, that machine running. Thank you all very much. I had to, I had to run around with the microphone there, didn't I? <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and uh, Kevin usually does the microphone. Thank you. I'm hoping um, anything that involves vox and sort of vowels, then um, Delvin's in the audience who knows who leads the team and restores them to, uh, and has restored and keeps the machine running. <sighs> oh good, this is a problem. <laughs> so, um, how, how 
did the multiplication and division work? That seems to be quite a sophisticated thing to have wired into the hardware at that stage. What, what was the technology there? I have not the faintest idea. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it works. It's, it's exactly like one multiplication or one division. Um, so one, I don't know if we, we showed it, but there was um, all the units on the arithmetic bracket. The machine is a, is a decimal shifter. So what, it, what it's able to do, as well as doing um, addition um, from one store to another, it can also shift that addition on the way through. So the multiplication and division both use that mechanism um, to uh, it also be repeated. Um, multiplication as well, so it basically counts down on the contents of one store and doesn't repeat an addition onto another. And using the shift that basically using the multiplication. Just how you did it in the Yes, it's very similar. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you talk about the machine being um, extremely reliable. Was it uh, Serviced on a uh, regular maintenance basis or just uh, fixed on fail? Um, at Harwell, it was it was maintained. Um, that it was something to do for the job to actually sort of run diagnostic programs on, well, it's term, but run test programs on the machine as well. It was very well very well looked after at Harwell. Um, there wasn't that depth of knowledge at Wolverhampton. Uh, and I think people worked out various techniques and sort of adjusting bias voltages and bending relay contacts to keep it going. Um, certainly towards the end at Wolverhampton, early on at Wolverhampton, um, they were um, actually making modifications to the machine. Um, the, 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 the print layout was fixed uh, at Harwell and um, just tabular. Um, and that was changed at Harwell to actually you know, change the Wolverhampton to allow them to have different format prints as well. So early on, I think they were, they were, they, the machine was looked after very well, but towards the end it was just fixed on fault. I saw somebody... So, well, my, go on, my, my kind of question of. Was, was similar in way. What do you say? Yeah, yeah. And there will be a All right, it's about error detection. What sort of... Um, internal error um, detection did it have, for example, parity or memory, or does it not check some on, um, on the input to the table? But uh, the parity is in the phone, the microphone's here. Yes, uh, none whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, typically what people would do in those days, you, you, would, you would actually code your program to perhaps try to obtain the same result in different ways, and then you would actually check that it matched up. And indeed, a lot of the test programs that we have on that the tapes that Kevin showed earlier that we've inherited um, do things like multiplying numbers together and then dividing them and then checking that the, the result is the same, and doing that in all different stores if the machine is one. So, so that's really how error checking is done by uh, repeating the calculations in different ways. You've got the retry mentioned as well. Oh, the next one, Yeah. No. no. You might like to explain to people why you've got that store hanging on the left-hand side. It's an interesting story in its own right. I, I, I'm not doing very well here. I don't know the answer to that either. I, I know I, I can show the cuts on my forehead when walking past it. I think it's very sharp. That's still very sharp. So, Kevin um, mentioned that Wolverhampton did a number of modifications. Well, when they got the machine, they, they also got a spare store with it was that, that, uh, that store on the end, and they thought, well, actually the machine is able to address up to, up to 99, so what we might as well do is uh, lash that on, and they, they built some decks in uh, racking on the side of the post office racks that the rest of the machine is built out of, and they, they mounted that store there, which, which does give it quite an interesting look. <laughs> yes. so, so that now represents the, um, the, the maximum uh, amount of store that the machine can address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless you've got, you got David Wheels in Cambridge, you can devise it. <laughs> um, carrying on from an earlier question, um, which tape code was being used? And was it subject to um, one decimal digit changing into another if the hole was mismunched? 
Uh, again, I'll go on that, don't Why not? Don't stand up at the front. It'll be much easier to maintain it. Um, the, the code, they devised the code themselves, but they, it wasn't yeah. completely done at random. Um, for instance, all the digit codes are two holes, yeah. um, and, and, and that's mainly what, what's used. And then the other codes that are used are three hole codes. Yeah. And that did enable them to do some checking, actually, within the, um, within the relay sets. Um, when you're expecting a digit, if you end up with an invalid code, it will stop. So basically, anything the machine um, doesn't like, it stops. There's no error indication other than it just freezes. Uh, and then you can obviously, being constructed the way it is, you can just look at it and go, here's the state of the relays, what's the machine doing, and you can figure out why it's stopped, usually. Mm -hmm. Dan, what's the back? Sorry, Dan. Just chap in front of the top. Does he use it in the other one? Yeah. yeah. Well, I haven't mentioned the trigger tubes, which I know have been an issue. Is that? Can I just supplement you again, my friend? But I, I, I did make use of, um, I did some experiments with trigger tubes many decades ago. Um, um, you, you mentioned about it um, being you left unattended over Christmas. Does it work in the dark? It looks fantastic in the dark. Trigger tubes can be a bit temperamental. Oh no, it's, uh, there are stories, um, uh, when, it was on, when, no, when it was used in Wolverhampton, it was on, um, in, in um, a room adjacent to the sort of principal's office, with big glass windows looking out over the market square in Wolverhampton, and this could be seen at night uh, from the market square, and, and, and it does look fantastic now at night. But yeah, this is a good problem. Oh, go on, far away, please. Thank you. Shout a bit. Yeah. yeah. I'm lying up next to the next question. I'll shout from here. Right? I thought this museum had more than one microphone. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, yes, the, 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 the other type of cold cathode device is trigger tubes. There's two different types uh, of trigger tube in the machine, but they, they both have priming circuits. So, the priming, so the priming channel, if you like. So, the priming, what the priming um, circuit does, it, it keeps a constant low. Uh, degree of ionisation within the tube, which means that um, you don't need light. Because I, I know what you're referring to, some of the early tree tubes needed um, actually light, light to kick off ionisation. That also meant that they would be very slow as well. Um, the ones in which were, were called high speed tree tubes and they were uh, rather advanced for the time. There's, there's very, um, I've read the patent for it, it's, it's quite, it looks quite a simple device, but actually the physics involved in this operation is it's quite advanced for really, a week at time. I suppose any radiation leaks in the area would uh, make it work anyway. Are you going to shout? Yeah, I'll just shout from here because it's easier than getting David to walk up and down again. I mean, one of the things about having working devices in a museum context is how difficult is it to keep it going? Have you had many failures of, of these tricky components that we've heard about this afternoon and have you actually cornered the entire market in spares for decatrons? Um, if I knew the first bit, you're quite right, having it, important, having it working is vital. Um, the museum sees school parties um, pretty well every day of the, uh, every day of the week at, uh, and these are some groups of 30 to 50 uh, school children. Uh, one of the um, issues we have at the moment is um, you saw where the, the, the witch machine wasn't in, in, the, in the museum. It was surrounded by a workshop area while the restoration took place. We've now temporarily moved the witch while we're building a whole new gallery around it. And which goes back into place on Saturday and Sunday and has to work because education tours start again on Monday morning when this is a key part of the tour. Now, in terms of what fails, yeah, the um, trick tubes are actually one of the most unreliable parts of the machine. The high, high speed trick tubes in particular, but there's only one type of them. Um, there are no other equivalents. Now, we've been quite lucky in that we've got lots and lots of these. You know, we, we obtain about 200 at a time. The only problem is only 10% worked. Um, what, what happens, and it is, it is quite a strange fault, because these are kind of 1950s uh, devices. But what seems to happen is that they've lost their, well not vacuum, because they're not vacuum filled, but they've lost their gas filling. Now, the, the, the problem of, of keeping valves um, 
platinum type or gas type but had largely been solved by the 1950s. And the other type, I said there are two types of trigger tube. The second type of trigger tube in the machine, we've got lots of those too, and they all work. We haven't had a single one not working. So it suggests that actually there was some kind of production problem with this particular high-speed tube that the machine uses. Um, which is a pity because that's probably, I mean, we, we have enough certainty to, to last for a long time, but looking far forward into the future, that's probably going to be a component that eventually we won't be able to replace anymore and we'll have to work around with some modern solid state um, uh, bulge hidden, hidden in the back. So typically what we've done to get around failed components, we've left the originals in place. And I think in the power supplies, Kevin mm -hmm. showed a lot of ancient looking rectifiers, and most of those don't work either. And indeed, most of them have already been replaced with silicon ones at Wolverhampton. So we've added a few more, but they're all, they're all carefully hidden, so the look of the machine is preserved. Um, and as I say, it is mainly original. Certainly the Decatrons, which would be the critical thing, if they prove not to be reliable, Again, most of the ones in the machine are well over 60 years old. And we know that because um, they stopped production on the very first type of GC 10A, which is the majority of the Decatrons, they're the fainter type. Uh, they were effectively the, the prototype for the, the GC 10B, which came along as much brighter, much, much easier to read. Uh, I've actually we've contacted, as a result of all the publicity from the, re the relaunch, the, the person who invented Decatron actually contacted us, still alive, <laughs> Um, very interesting. It gives a lot of background information as well about, about the early days and how the, the machine came, up, came about because he remembered very clearly Ted put the other visiting him and, and uh, you know, to talk about Decatrons and possible applications for them. But it turns out they are incredibly reliable. Um, as I said, over 60 years old and, and showing no signs of, of stopping it working. <laughs> This is a non-technical question. Come on, thank God. Um, I caught sight of um, one of the slides up there. I think it was about. Um, I'm just trying to visualise again. It had the um, Birmingham, uh, sorry, the Wolverhampton News and Mail, and a sort of menu list of the which is Ah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and there was a name on there, and I just wondered whether I could do a check on the name to you know more about it. Ah, uh, but it's very bad. You have any there? That was, um, yeah. Do you know anything about the R. Woolley? Yes. Yes. He wrote, there's, um, I mentioned a publication that they produce on numerical analysis, and um, that's William Woolridge, and he wrote that particular book. Then left for New Zealand um, some years afterwards. Is that the same chap? Oh, I, I, I think it is, yeah. Oh, right. The, the only reason I've got the interest in that is uh, in my early sales days, I had Birmingham Wolverhampton on my pack about the early 60s, but we were actually trying to sell them something else. So. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I don't even remember any contact with the, uh, with the British. Oh, no, no. Okay, we're not. <laughs> um, I mentioned, like, please. The source of these um, press articles is, t is terrific, and I think that, that's it's encouraged by that. Why we've managed to, why we've had the machine sort of so widely covered in the press, um, the the cut down version of the video I showed you at the end uh, went viral on YouTube. Heaven only knows why. It had over a million hits over that Christmas. It's just quite phenomenal. Um, and I think I think both of us have certainly been appeared on Chinese state television describing them. No, no, that was you, wasn't it? Chinese state television. Neither the Canadian one. Chinese is better than one. Yes. It's a fantastic amount of coverage. I, I, we just, it just seemed to have just ticked the right boxes for this at, at the right time. It's been quite incredible, really. I think I just had a simple point that the impact of that on these school parties is phenomenal. Yeah. Really believe, I don't think we believe it would be like that. That they, they suddenly start to understand the computer for the first time. Yeah. I think it's, it, well, I don't know. Is it on? Yes. yes. Uh, By the way, copies of the book are available. <laughs> the one, the one signed by the author are worth less than the one. It's on Amazon as well, so. Oh.
Well, thank you very much indeed, Helen, for the presentation and everything and for answering questions. I'm, I'm thank really you for joining Now, the presentation next time is on the second Thursday of the month, not as it says on the website. It's no, that's Thursday. Well, it's, it's updated, March. is it? March. We're talking about March, but we're talking about the next is the 20th of February. March. 13th of February. Yeah. No, the, the, the website is correct. It's yes. the, the meeting in February as is the third Thursday. Yeah, it's the meeting after that, the March one, right. which for some of us happens to be a committee meeting as well, is a week earlier. Okay. 20th of February, the next meeting. Andrew Herbert, who's going to be speaking on the EDSAC replica project and the very good progress that's being made with that. And the one after that is the 13th of March. March 13th, and that's the day of Korea from the United States. Thank you, Roger. You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, and if you can remember to sign the attendance list on your way out if you haven't already. So thank you very much for coming along. Thank you.